is a, a great panel, I think, because it sort of touches upon so many areas that affect directly um, when a private foundation, an individual, an NGO wants to work in Haiti, um, has an interest in um, going down to Haiti, and we have a echo here, I'm sorry. Um, what we're dealing with on this panel is we're addressing uh, the political um, instability or stability, um, the history of institutionalized, you would say maybe, racism, um, the health crisis and how uh, inaccessibility or accessibility uh, becomes a factor. And then of course what Professor Olson was saying, which I think really speaks to a um, foundation, or, uh, NGO, that wants to, um, to work in Haiti. For myself, our foundation, initially we got involved working um, in community health and development uh, in the plateau. Um, and of course, like many people who are interested, um, when they first uh, want to work in a, in a foreign country, you choose a topic or a subject that interests you, whether it's children, health care, education, and you go in with these, with these great dreams and expectations, I'm going to go go to school, or I'm going to go bring books to, to kids in the countryside. And of course, these are, these are all great motivators while going in. Um, but it doesn't speak to all of the factors that need to be addressed that eventually could create more problems uh, down the line and going in and creating what I think has happened in Haiti over the last few decades is almost a shadow <coughs> government run by NGOs. Um, the NGO community, uh, while the intention there is to improve the life and livelihood of the people, um, has in turn circumvented uh, working directly with government institutions, whether it's the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, um, because of this uh, suspected corruption, which of course exists <coughs> in the country um, on some level or another. It's just a matter of how well it's exposed, I think. Um, so in circumventing the government, we in turn, and I say we, meaning the international community, has in effect um, made the government of Haiti relatively um, uh, what, would, what would the word be? I don't want to say impotent, but in a sense, they feel powerless when it comes to decisions being made for them. Um, they don't feel in many ways that they have their own voice. And I think it's important for NGOs um, and, and private foundations to really take the time to understand um, the processes of working through a government, even though you might not see, as we've heard on this panel, um, the laws that are in place being directly enforced. And that speaks to um, having a multi-tiered approach in, in going in and working in development to um, direct services, service delivery, and also policy. I think it's very important um, that we address policy change and affect effective policy change when we discuss education, when we discuss health care, for example, when, when you were speaking about cholera and the accessibility to just hydration centers, um, everyone that's gone to Haiti since the cholera epidemic wants to set up or has set up um, a clinic or a, a, a mobile hydration center, um, which is wonderful because it's immediate and people can go immediately and get. But when we're speaking down the line, how is this going to be when, when those tents shut down and the money runs out that's been raised over the last year or six months, uh, what's left behind? Are we leaving behind educated doctors, nurses, community health workers, or are we bringing in our own people and then leaving? Um, the importance is to educate people on the ground, to facilitate programs that bring um, inclusive education, not just we're bringing in teachers from another country to come in, or we're bringing in doctors or we're bringing in equipment that in turn uh, we either take back or is left in hospitals where people aren't trained to use them. So what becomes a good intention eventually down the line can become something that is detrimental um, or at least creating um, resentment in a way. So I think you know what everyone has spoken to on this panel from um, enforcing policy to um, what Professor Stefik was saying, whereas in the institutionalized concepts that we have about Haiti, um, I think that it's important to address cultural competency.
when um, going into a country, whether it's Haiti or any other uh, country with a long history of political uh, instability and crisis. Uh, for me, it happens to be Haiti, and I think that the level of cultural competency um, that many NGOs have while going in, they say, well, it worked in Banda Acha after. It worked in uh, Thailand after the tsunami. Well, that's great, but that's not where we're at now. So in order to um, create what we would like to say a cohesive approach, working with the government, having NGOs work together, private foundations working together, it's important to understand and have a cultural competency when you're going into, whether it's through <coughs> the government or into the countryside or working with uh, people directly on the ground. I, I feel in my personal experience that that has been one of the biggest hurdles um, in dealing with trying to bring people in, trying to raise money, and trying to create programs is trying to get people to understand a little bit more um, the, the culture of Haiti and how important it is for the people themselves. The nationalism and the patriotism that the people of Haiti have is something that cannot be overlooked. And when we go in and we come in with our own ideas and do not allow them to have a voice in that, what will happen down the line, we might have a, a very good response right now for six months, but down the line, it ain't gonna fly. It's not gonna stay. So I will speak to um, what you were saying earlier about uh, the comparison between the um, reaction, the international reaction to the, to the Cuban community's arrival here in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, but that is actually something that inspired me to get involved in Haiti. I had been working um, here in, in Miami for many years in the Little Haiti community, but I was watching the Elian Gonzalez uh, events unfold. And I don't know if anyone remembers or lived here when um, Elian was sent to Disney World, but made the front page of the Miami Herald, it made the news, and uh, Channel 7, of course. But at the same time, um, on Key Biscayne, a boat of about 210 Haitian refugees um, arrived and were jumping onto the bridge and they had aerial shots. And yeah. I was watching all of this and, and at the same time I was watching and reading about Elian Gonzalez going to Disney World. And there was a little girl, an image uh, of a, a, a photograph of a little girl being lowered down from the boat that she had just spent probably six days at sea, crowded with 210 people on that boat. And she had a, a beautiful, unspoiled yellow dress. And she was being lowered down by her family. And that still really stuck out to me. Because I thought, here's Ellen Gonzalez getting all this attention. That little girl was sent to Chrome. And eventually she was probably sent home. And I thought to myself, my gosh, what, what, what has happened over the last you know, decade or so that has enabled this, enabled the public to accept that? And I wrote a letter to the Miami Herald big mistake. So I wrote the letter saying, I, you know, I'm confused and the next thing I knew I, I would, the foundation was receiving phone calls from Haitian leaders throughout Miami saying, all right, you wrote it, you're interested, come see. So I had been to Haiti before, but that's when I actually felt that the foundation needed to really get involved and that the community opened up to me and took me down and I went to Haiti and I was able to then go in with people here that kind of knew what my intentions were. So I think that um, in addressing this panel, which um, I'm very honored to, to have been a part of, and I, and I thank you, um, what I'd like for all of us to keep in mind is that all of these approaches, each and every single thing that we've talked about, is the most important. And we have to have a vertical approach in dealing with rebuilding Haiti, whether it's building back, as Bill Clinton likes to say, building back better. Um, we need to build everything together. There's not one thing that is more of a priority than the other. Because we're going to be sitting here again, deja vu all over again. We'll be sitting here having the same discussion. And it says here that I work uh, with, with the Clinton Global Initiative on, on culture. Um, it was very, very challenging to get the international donor community uh, interested after the earthquake um, in anything involved with culture. It's gonna to have to happen later. We don't wanna hear about rebuilding libraries or museums. Well, the libraries and the museums are the heart and the history of the country of Haiti, the people of Haiti. And without recognizing that and rebuilding that, um, 
we're losing out and we're not going to succeed. So um, <coughs> I think that I'm very happy to be here with everybody and I'm glad that we're all on a vertical line. So what I'd like to show now, we're showing a piece, it's actually, I'm a filmmaker, this is not one of my films, but this film, um, it's a six minute piece and it was Haiti is music. Can we not? And music is Haiti. Like and Haiti is also the symbol of yeah, free. Thank you. I'd, I'd just like to introduce it before. I know Danny Glover is a little more famous than I am, but um, the piece was was uh, uh, made about two weeks after the earthquake, and a lot of the footage that you're going to see was filmed prior to the earthquake. Um, it's uh, a composer, Jean Jean Pierre, Haitian composer, uh, wrote this piece, and it was actually conducted by the. Uh, Dominican Republic Symphonic Orchestra. And it was very symbolic to have the two countries on the same line and come together in such a way. And it speaks to, um, to hope. And I think that this is a beautiful way to end this discussion. So, now we can let Haiti is music, and music is Haiti. And Haiti is also the symbol of freedom from slavery. The Haitian Revolution marked the first successful slave revolt. That victory embodies the spirit of the Haitian people. On January 12, 2010, an earthquake devastated parts of the land we call Haiti. The musical composition by Haitian composer Jean-Jean Pierre is the first ever in history.